Apostle Paul is writing to a group of Christians in Rome, and many of them were Jewish Christians that came to faith in Christ. And I'm sure that many of them were wondering about their own nation. They were taught about the Jewish people and the promises that God made to Abraham, the Abrahamic covenant, and the promise that he made to David, which is the Davidic covenant. All these promises that God would call out a very special people, and from this people, all the nations of the world would be blessed. They would have their own land. There would be millions of these people, and they would have a great influence. But part of those covenants also came with they needed to follow the Lord Jehovah and obey him. If you wanted to see what it says in Deuteronomy 28, you'll find that in that passage alone, it's going to talk about if you do these wonderful things, you will be blessed if you do not, that the Lord will bring all the enemies against the Jews. And that has happened all the way back from almost the beginning of the Jews. And now they're living at a particular time where that the Jewish people probably felt like God even came to a point of abandoning them and rejecting them. And so while Paul is building his case in chapter 1 through chapter 8 about faith alone and Christ alone and security and sanctification, he now steps back under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit to now teach on God who is sovereign. And what he chose to do is to pick out a unique area of God's sovereignty, which would be his never-ending faithfulness, whether we feel it or experience at that moment that God has for those, even when they're disobedient. So 9... 10 and 11 of Romans speak on the sovereignty of God, but even more specifically on his faithfulness. And I think that there is no greater way that we can see the faithfulness of God than how he is and how he has and how he will treat the Jews. Now, I imagine even now as you open up the newspaper, you can see what's happening with the Jewish nation and why they are crying as perhaps a little voice in the wilderness out there in the Middle East perhaps the closest to any democratic society amidst all that other kind of belief systems and political arena. And how they would scream so loudly when Iran would uh, strike up a deal with America. And in a sense, perhaps in the long run, and I'm not going to get too political, really what's happened is that deal has eventually nuclearized the entire Middle East. And of course, based on the testimony of the nations that are there, some louder than others, but all saying basically the same thing. They live for the extermination of the nation of Israel as well as the United States. So that's why even back then and even now, the Jewish people could feel like they had been abandoned by God to the point that they don't even believe in God. And now you have a lot of agnostic Jews and not real true Jews. Now they can go to synagogue, they can wear all the right garments, they could celebrate special high holy days, but they have never accepted Jesus Christ as their Messiah, which is really the beginning point of being a biblical true Jew. Now, they are a Jew in nature and ethnicity, but not a believing Jew for eternality with God. Now, I'm laying that as the groundwork because I want to give you, if you look at your notes for a moment, those three chapters is a little bit of a review, and then we're going to drill into chapter 11. And even chapter 11 has many verses, and there's so many truths, almost every other phrase has a... a, a, a it's like a tentacle to go deeper into God's word. I'm just going to give you the Himalaya mountain peaks of this and encourage you to read all of Romans 11 with a good study Bible and perhaps a commentary. But I want you to get what I'm going to call now today the bird's eye view of the faithfulness of God as it relates to Israel. So I've titled the message, God, the Ultimate Promise Keeper to Israel. Chapter 9, it talks about Israel's past, so if you want to go back and review that, you can. You're going to see that basically God has selected that there would be a new nation of Jews, and it would start with one man and one woman who were really Gentiles, who basically from then, Abraham and Sarah, we see the Jewish nation. Now, we see the word sovereignty there, and that is because that nation was begun, not because there were anything special, not because Abraham was so special. It was God was setting up his economy for all eternity and showing himself strong in the behalf of the Jewish people so that they would be his people and had to have a beginning. And it began in chapter 9, Israel's past, his sovereignty. Well, then he gets into chapter 10 and it talks about Israel's present. Now, when you see Israel's present there, you need, might need to understand that's present during the time of Paul, but it also dispensationally will bring us to the present of Israel even to today. So there would be the present then, even though it's past 2,000 years for Paul's day when he wrote Romans, but it's also for today. And there's that experience of perhaps rejection. 
I put that in there because I wanted you to feel the pathos of feeling like God is really not there. But in reality, you're going to see that it's not. It's a major time out. It's a major setting aside. And that's the term I'm going to be using through the rest of the outline. But I wanted you to feel the pathos again of being really rejected. I hope you've never gone through that. I hope you've never had people that have been in your life that really said how much they loved you and then abandoned you. I hope you've never had that go through a marriage or a breakup because you'll know what that feels like. Well, I want you to know that you're going to learn today, especially, and then again next week, that even though the Lord had set them aside, he never rejected them. He never abandoned them. He couldn't do that because of his very nature of who he is and the promises that he made to Israel. So again, it's the fairness of God. He had to do something when the children of Israel chose to disobey him. And he said that. He said, if you do this, I will honor. If you don't do this, you're going to have all these judgments on you. And they chose to go another way, and thus calamity occurred to them. So again, he didn't abandon his word and what he told them. So there was fairness there. He kept his word. And now we're into chapter 11, where we'll be in the, for the next few minutes here. And this is really talking about Israel's future. We'll see a little bit of the future now as we see the Jews have been given their land. But there's so much more that's going to the future. And I like the word restoration, so you may want to circle that. I remember when I was in that time out that mom had placed me into when my sister uh, did the wrong thing by obeying me and jumping down that chute. I remember when mom finally said, okay, Stan, you've been there long enough. Have you learned your lesson? And my answer was what? No, I want to do it again. I said, yes, I did. And my mom gave me the biggest hug. And what that did is it reminded me that before I did it and while I was in timeout, mom really loved me. But I didn't experience that intimacy with mom until she released me from that timeout. There was that restoration. And that's why I put the faithfulness of God. He was faithful all through this. But there is that faithfulness that God will restore us. And I think some of you might have already experienced God's faithfulness. Now, we teach our children about God's faithfulness as we so should. But I want it to be more than just a verse here and a verse there. I want us to see God's operation of faithfulness. And there's no greater group to do that with than Israel. And the reason I say that now is because you can follow the history of the Jews, whether you want to read it through Scripture or you want to get into a world history book, and you're going to see what's happened to the Jewish people, especially then when they became a nation and what happened in their life. And no matter what, no matter what, they would, uh, what would happen to the Jewish people, they could never extinguish them. So while I know that all the guns in the arsenal might be pointed at Israel even now, I know that Israel will never cease to exist. And primarily, it's not because of their goodness, but because of God's grace in his faithfulness. So let's begin here. I gave you a little bit of a review. Now let's talk about the setting aside of Israel as the chosen people of God, and that it's going to be limited and it's not complete. I wanted you to see the setting aside was limited. But it's not a complete setting aside where he's abandoned them. And there are four proofs of it, and it's found in Romans chapter 11. So let's begin. First of all, Paul himself is an example of saying no matter what those children of Israel have done from the time they came into existence even until his day, you see that God hasn't abandoned him because of him. He's still around. So let's look in verse 1. It says, I say then, God has not rejected his people, has he? And the answer is, may it never be. Now, if you want to go a little bit further, circle the phrase, may it never be, and run it through just the book of Romans alone, and you're going to see where Paul asks this almost rhetorical question, and immediately he answers it always, may it never be. It's the strongest statement in the Greek possible. So when it says, no, he won't reject you, it's not like, no, he won't, but he might, you never know. No, it's, he will never reject them. And so you have this confidence that God will never set the Jews aside forever. Then he says, for I too am an Israelite, a descendant of Abraham of the tribe of Benjamin, smallest tribe still of Abraham where it all began. And it talks about not rejecting his people nor himself as an individual, which is interesting that when you come to the Lord, that he will never leave you nor forsake you. Now, there may be other religious people that might name the name of the Lord, and it may appear that he has set them aside, but I want you to know that the gospel is still open for them if they would come to faith in Christ alone. So Paul is an example of God not setting aside the entire Jewish people forever. He still became a Christian, and when he did, he became a great voice for God to the world, Gentiles specifically. But not just Paul, but there was also others. That would be the second one. There's a remnant. 
which means that there's a people group that God still says, even through all of this, when it seems like the Lord has rejected him, there is a remnant that have never bowed their knee to the Lord, that have trusted the Lord Jehovah as their Savior. Notice it says, God has not rejected his people whom he foreknew, or do you not know what the scripture says in this passage about Elijah, how he pleads with God against Israel? Now, if you will look up here, let me tell you the backstory. We won't have time to turn there, but the backstory is simply this. There was a time in Israel's history of the Old Testament that pretty much the entire country was given over to idolatry. In a sense, they abandoned God and all that God would want them to do. It was led by wicked kings, and in this case, Queen Jezebel. And while that was going on, at that particular time, Elijah decided to have a contest. He was going to take the priests of Baal, put them up on this particular mountain, and then have a sacrifice to see if Baal now would answer their prayers. Now, of course, he knew that wouldn't be the case, but he put them through that test. And they screamed, and they hollered, and they danced, and they cut themselves, and blood flowed even from them, doing all that they could to bring down fire from heaven from Baal. And it never really happened, and even Elijah mocked him for that. And so then he just, with one word, after he set up the altar and he built the trenches and he poured water on it, poured water again on it, so there's no way this ever sacrifice would light. God, with one movement, brought an explosion of fire and that sacrifice was gone. Now, that being the case, you could see that he had great, great strength. He did not fear 400 priests, and yet he did fear Jezebel because when Jezebel heard about that, she was so upset that she went after Elijah's life, so he ran almost the length of the state of Florida to get away, and then he crashed and burned practically, and he cries unto God the next part of this verse, and look at it. He says to the Lord, Lord, they've killed your prophets, they've torn down your altars, and I alone am left, and they're seeking my life. Now, what was God's response? Well, very simple. The Lord speaks from heaven and says, I have kept for myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to Baal. Now, here's my point, that God always has a remnant of those who are going to stand strong. There'll be a remnant, and there's a remnant of Jews that God still will feed and deal with. Now, they will not have all their property yet. They will not have all the power of their own country yet. They will not have all the fulfillment of the prophecy, as it says in the major and minor prophets, but they are still God's people. These are Jewish believers. It's interesting how excited we get here at, at International that every other year we've been blessed to have Arnold Fruchtenbaum, who himself is Jewish, who's come to faith in Christ and has a massive global ministry to help reach Jewish people for Christ. I'm thrilled that our own church supports a missionary whose main objective is to reach the Jewish rabbis in Atlanta and is having a great inroad to them and how many Jewish people are coming to faith in Christ. Those are all part of the remnant of the Lord. So again, it's limited in their time out, but not complete. There are some that are still coming to faith in Christ. They're still in existence today, which now means uh, why was there a remnant? Look at the next passage. They were chosen by grace. I like that. In the same way, then, there also has come to be in the present time a remnant. Notice again, remnant, remnant, according to God's gracious choice. Now, underlying verse 6, if you will, this is a very important verse to know and to memorize. It says, but if it be by grace, it is no longer on the basis of works. Otherwise, grace is no longer grace. Now, let me see if I can explain this to you. This is a great verse to use when you want to use it in a salvation experience, leading someone to Christ. Again, the bigger truth is that these Jews came into existence by God's grace. They're set aside by God's grace. God, by His grace, is going to do a great work with the Jews now and especially in the future. It is not based upon works. Now, let's talk about salvation. The Bible says that we're all sinners. We've all done something wrong. The Bible says by nature and choice, we're separated from God and we'll spend eternity in hell. The Bible says we've got to be perfect to go to heaven, but we can't be perfect. We'll never be perfect enough. That's why, again, Scripture says it's not by good works that gets us into heaven. Now, people might come back and say, well, what about religious works? Will God then look upon them with favor and then allow us to get into heaven because we've done some religious good deeds? No. What about social good deeds, taking care of the hunger, the, the starving, the, the cold, the abandoned people? If we do good to our fellow man, won't God smile on us and we'll gain his favor and get into heaven? The answer is no. God operates on the basis of G-R-A-C-E, on the basis of grace. Now, notice this. When you deal with God's grace, you have God's grace. Grace and works 
are miles apart. You cannot combine the two. And that's what this verse says. If it's of grace, it can't be of works. Otherwise, grace is no more grace. Those of you that have a King James version of the Bible, it flips it and adds another phrase. If it's of works, then it can't be by grace. Otherwise, work is no more works. So the point of the matter is, when we deal with the Lord, His grace is to us, we receive that grace not by any works. It's either by grace or by works. Scripture says it's not of works. This verse says it can't be by grace plus works. So then we deduce from that that our relationship with God is based on one thing and one thing alone, and that is the grace of God in Him alone. That's why Scripture says it's according to His mercy, another form of grace that we're saved. It's according to grace, for by grace are you saved through faith. It's all of grace. So you can combine the two. So when we say we're trusting Christ, that's the grace part. But if we say we have to be water baptized also to be saved, that's the work part. If we say it's by grace, trusting Christ, but we also have to keep the Ten Commandments, that is also by works to get into heaven. Now, is that to say we should never be baptized? Yes, we're baptized by immersion after we trusted Christ as an outward sign of something we've done in the past. So we don't front load the gospel with works. Watch this. We don't back load the gospel by having to do good works once we're saved to stay saved. Everything about salvation is by grace and not of works. And that's the economy that God is working on with the Jewish people. So to become, in their case, what we might say, uh, a saved Jew, it's based on their grace, not keeping any of their Old Testament law. That's something that they do outwardly, but not as a way to get into heaven. They needed to believe in their Messiah. So what happened then to Israel? Here you got the remnant. God chose with them with grace. What happened to the whole country or the whole nation of Israel? What, what went on? Well, there was a great deal of discipline that went on. And they were disciplined, but they weren't completely rejected. I'm going to read a passage of Scripture. If you want to read with me, you can. It's going to be found in Jeremiah 31. It's not a long passage. But I wanted you to see from the Old Testament writing, not just the New Testament, what I'm teaching you here is coming from both Testaments, as Paul now speaks to this. It's a very eye-opening passage. And I'll just read a portion of it, not the entire passage. Jeremiah 31, in the beginning of verse 31, it says... Behold, days are coming, declares the Lord Jehovah, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Verse 34. It says, They will not teach again, each man his neighbor and each man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they will all know me in the future, from the least of them to the greatest of them, declares the Lord. Here it is. Underline it. For I will forgive their iniquity and their sin will I remember no more. So God says, I will discipline them, but I'll never cast them away forever. Verse 37 says, Thus says the Lord, if the heavens above can be measured, and we're still trying to measure them now with the new uh, uh, satellites and spaceships going up to Mars and Pluto, and the foundations of the earth are searched out below, we have a submersible submarine that can go already 35,000 feet below the surface of the earth, but we still can't search out all the foundations. He says if we could do all of that, he says, then I will also cast off the offspring of Israel for all that have done. And he says, I'm not going to cast them away forever. Go to Psalm, if you will, for a moment. Psalm 89. What a great passage of comfort. And this is kind of a passage of what parents might do with their own children. So look in Psalm 89. Just listen to this neat passage. He says, if his sons forsake my law and do not walk in my judgments, if they violate my statutes, the Lord says, and do not keep my commandments, then I will punish their transgression with the rod and their iniquity with stripes. Let me just pause for a moment. The Jewish people are underneath a lot of the judgment of the Lord, and they're experiencing a lot of that now because they have walked away from what God told them to do. And it's not merely keeping all the Old Testament sacrifices. It all begins with not accepting Jehovah Yasha, their Messiah, as their own Savior. And then from that comes all their activities. Verse 33, and he says, But I will not break off my loving kindness from them. Basically saying, no matter what they've done, I will not stop loving them. Nor will I deal falsely in my faithfulness. What that means, he says, I'm not going to say I'm faithful and then break my faithfulness. My covenant I will not violate, nor will I alter the utterance of my lips. Once I have sworn by my holiness, I'm not going to lie to David or his descendants. Shall endure forever, and his throne is the sun before me. It shall be established forever like the moon, and the witness in the sky is faithful, meaning that the moon will never be extinguished until a certain time. It's going to be there, and I'm the witness to those people. So when God makes a promise, he keeps the promise. So again, they will be disciplined, but not completely rejected. 
Let's go to the third and final point, well, third point, I should say. How long will all of this last? How long are they going to be involved in this? Now, I wish I had time to put charts up here to show you when it all began, what the dispensations are, what the tribulation looks like. But in a general way, how long is this going to last? How long will this happen? Well, it's going to be temporary, very similar to the first point, not complete. So write the word temporary there. It is a temporary. Now, how do I get that? Look in verse 11. It says, I say then, they did not stumble so as to fall, did they? And there's that phrase again. No, may it never be. Have you ever thought about what's the difference between stumbling and falling? I remember when I was, a, I was teaching in Bible college, and um, my secretary came to the back of a class, and they said, uh, Prof, you need to get to the office right now. There's an emergency. I was dean of men, so I knew that something had to happen with one of our guys. I needed to get there, so I said, students, I need to leave right now. You, just wait. I'll be right back as soon as I can. Now, that sounds pretty neat. I run down the hall to get to my office to get to the phone, no cell phones in those days. That sounds pretty easy. But now let me take you back in time, if you don't mind. It was in the days of bell bottoms and all those polyester leisure suits. How many remember those days, all right? And when you had those bell bottoms, these were so fancy schmancy ones, they even had a cuff on them. And so I'm running, and these bell bottoms are flopping everywhere. My foot gets caught in one of the, the, the cuffs, and I go tumbling down, and I'm falling down as I'm just crashing into the wall as I do this, and I look all around. Did anybody see me? Nope. I jump right back up, and I'm going to my office, you know, just about like this to get to where I need to go. Now, why am I telling you that? The difference between stumbling and falling, when you fall, generally it's a more of a permanent situation, but when you stumble, you're going to stumble and get back up again. And so what you're seeing here is a stumbling of Israel, but not a total fall and annihilation by God of Israel. So it's a temporary thing, not a complete thing with them. So why were they set aside? Now we're getting into the meat. This gets really good. So if they did all of this stuff and God still loved them and all he did was discipline them and he had all these promises, why in the world did he ever set them aside? Here it is, so that the Gentiles could be saved. Look at the verse there. It says, but by their transgression, salvation comes to the Gentiles. So in other words, by the wrong choices of the Jews, their transgression, then God gave the attention to the Gentiles so the Gentiles then could hear about the Lord. Now, those of you that are a little bit into the word, you might understand this. Out of the 12 apostles, one was a rummy, so you're down to 11. They added another one don't see much about him. Then they added a 13th one, which would be the Apostle Paul. The two big mouths of the group would be Paul and Peter. Peter was assigned to specifically go back to the Jews and give the Jews salvation. And that's why you find a lot with Peter, tremendous amount of persecution as he goes through the book of Acts. And you see what he's doing because he's trying to reach the Jews. The Apostle Paul, though, was given a calling by the Lord to go specifically to the Gentiles. But he loved the Jews so much, since he was a Jew, he would go into the synagogues first when he went into a town, and he always went to the Jew first, but also then to the Gentiles, although his calling was mostly to the Gentiles. So what was happening? The Lord says, okay, Jews, you are my people, but you're not getting the message. You're not following my call to trust in the Messiah, Jesus. So he says, I'm now going to now turn my attention to the Gentiles. Now, when you read that, it's kind of like the Lord says, now what am I going to do? The Jews are bad. Let me see if I can come up with a plan. I don't want you to look at it that way. I want you to know that God in his divine, eternal wisdom, he already knew before he made the Jews, the Jews, he already knew what they were going to do, what was going to happen. He knew what the game plan was for part B. All of that was a signal to reach another people group with the same message. The Jews had to get saved the same way that the Gentiles do. The Gentiles got saved the same way the Jews did. Old Testament people get saved the same way the New Testament people do. The New Testament people get saved the same way the Old Testament people do. It is always by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone alone for the glory of God alone. Now, you might have other vestiges around this of things that they might do, like the, uh, the, the, the sacrifices and the special holy days, but none of those things added up to this is what you do to get saved. So now he turns his attention to the Gentiles so that they could be saved. Now, let me take you back to my first illustration. Now, remember I told you about my sister going down the chute, and then I was put in a timeout. I believe with all of my heart that my mother, as smart as she was, and while I'm sitting in this timeout and I'm just, you know, frying because I want to do something, I don't, I don't want to sit there, you know, and she's loving on my sister. I imagine my mom leaned over to my sister and hugged her and whispered in her ear and said, now I know that you're seeing what's happening to Stanley over there. 
Now, if you ever do something that dangerous, I want you to know that you will be put in a timeout too. So in other words, by my disobedience, my sister was given truce. And as I look back down memory lane in the Stan and Marianne album, I hardly ever see my sister getting in trouble. I don't ever remember her getting put in time. I really don't. I can never remember my mom or dad having a crossword at my sister. So when I got older, I asked her, I said, how come you were always so good? And she said, it was very easy. It's because you were always so bad. <laughs> Honestly. And it wasn't that that I was so bad. It's by my badness, she was able to see what mom and dad would do to my badness and she knew how to navigate better because of that. Now, that's a whole thing on child growth and development, just in that whole scheme, because that really does work. But that's what's happening here. Because of what the Jews did, the attention now is turned to the Gentiles. The second reason was to make Israel envious, which really happened, to make Israel envious. Now, remember what happened. They were doing something that was wrong, and now they're getting the gospel, uh, the, the Gentiles are, and they're coming to know Christ as Savior. They're coming into the churches. Things are happening to them. So now they look at that, the Jews do, and say, I'd like to have some of that myself. And it's so interesting now. Let me see if I can take you back in time. You know you have the church here. It's made up of all different ethnic groups, and we pretty well have what we might call a Gentilized church, which means we have very little vestiges of anything that would be Jewish. We don't sing Jewish old songs. We don't, we don't conduct our worship service in perhaps the same style of a synagogue-type service. We don't see that happening here. So we're going to call ourselves a Gentilized church, although the church itself is made up of anyone who's a believer, Jew or Gentile. We get that. Now you have Jewish people. They now see that we have uh, freedom in Christ now. We know that we have eternal life. We have joy. We have peace. We have everything that God will give to those that are Christians. And even to boot, when we live for the Lord, there's that extra sense of, of uniqueness with God that we have. They then hear the message. God sovereignly brings it to them, brings them the spirit, brings them conviction. They come to faith in their Messiah. And now they see that, and they're envious because of what we have. But at the same time, you have what we call messianic fellowship say that out loud with me messianic fellowship the reason they call it messianic is because those jews are now believing that jesus is their messiah so christ is at the center of it and they're believing that by faith alone in the messiah alone for their salvation it's a fellowship because it's often made up majority of other jewish people who came to faith in the messiah now there'll be some gentiles that will come in there as well and a lot of that is because of the envy that they have seen with us. Then they come to know Christ. They get excited about what's happening, but they still like to have some of their, and if I can dare use this word, some of their Jewish culture in it. And that's not necessarily wrong, but that does fit them. All right, so what should be our attitude right now toward Israel and all that's going on? What should be our attitude toward Israel? Well, I'd like to say it very simply. What it says here in this passage and I, don't, I wish I had time to go through it, but I want you to read verses 17 to 24 when you get home. And you're going to find out the warning there. Now Paul turns his attention away from the Jewish people that are Christians in the, synagogue, in the uh, church there at Rome. He now turns his attention to the Gentile believers. And he's basically saying to them, don't get haughty. Don't get haughty. Just like there was judgment with the Jews, there can be judgment with you all. God will not abandon you, but there will be discipline there. So I want you to know that God began here with faith alone and Christ alone, but don't get haughty just because you know Christ is your Savior. Remember that it's His kindness, it is His grace, it is His sovereignty that He saved us by faith alone. The next question was, how long is this setting aside going to last? Look in verse 25, if you will. There's a unique little phrase in this verse that gives us a little window on when that is. It says, for I do not want you, brethren, to be uninformed of this mystery. Again, that's a favorite phrase with Paul. I don't want you to be ignorant. And then he says, so that, or, so that you will not be wise in your own estimation. In other words, don't get haughty. That a partial hardening has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles have come in. So that means that this is ultimately going to end. There's a fullness of the Gentiles. Some people say that's going to happen during the tribulation. I'm getting very deep for some of you. But during the tribulation, there won't be many Christians at the beginning of it. There won't be any Christians at the beginning of it because they're all raptured out. So now we have two witnesses that come in. They've got to lead people to Christ through the witnesses, 144,000. They go, and then there's out of every tongue, voice, and multitude during the tribulation of people coming to know Christ as Savior. But the predominant focus during the tribulation is not going to be the church. It's going to be Israel, the Jews. 
So I'm sensing that the fullness of the Gentiles is going to happen at the, be, at, the, at the end of the church age, but before the tribulation, that then the attention is now turned toward the Jews. Now watch carefully. Even though there'll be so many Jewish people during the tribulation coming to faith, there'll also be many Gentiles coming to faith in the Lord, but the predominant focus will still be on the Jews, just like I said, during that period of time. And then at the end of the seven years, then he sets up his eternity future. I'm looking at the clock, so let me just give you this last verse, and then we'll end with the passage. Turn, if you will, to Zechariah. I love Zechariah. It's a great book. It has a lot of prophecy in here referring to the Messiah, Jesus, that you ought to read. And then you can see how it's fulfilled in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. All right, But I want you to look at this one passage if you can. And this would be Zechariah 12.10. If not, just listen. The Lord is now speaking. And he says this to the Jews. He says, I will pour out on the house of David, referring to the Jews, and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem, those who are living there specifically, I'll give them the spirit of grace and supplication so that they will look on me whom they have pierced. Ooh, that's a prophecy of the Messiah going to the crucifixion. They'll look upon me in the future of them whom they have pierced, and they will mourn for him as one mourns for the only son. Hmm, again, referring to Christ. And they will weep bitterly over him like the bitter weeping over a firstborn. So a sense... He's saying, in the future, they will now look to the Messiah who is now dead and risen again from the dead, and they're going to look upon him whom they have pierced, and they're going to look on him now in a faith looking upon him. Now, if you will go a little bit further, in chapter 13, in verse 8, it says, And it will come about in all the land, declares the Lord, verse 10, that two parts in it will be cut off and perish, but a third will be left in it, which means two-thirds of the Jews that have never come to faith. They will then perish, but a third that have come to faith will be left in it. And I will bring the third part through the fire and refine them as silver is refined and test them as gold is tested. They will call on my name, Jehovah. Call upon the name of the Lord and you'll be saved. And I will answer them. And how will I answer them? I will say, they are my people. And they will say, the Lord Jehovah is my Lord, my God, referring again to the Messiah. So there is a future coming for Israel that they will come to Christ, their Messiah, by the multitudes of them where right now they're trickling in little by little. And that again shows that God set them aside, but he hasn't rejected them. Now, that's a lot of information for you to digest. So I want to end with not just a history lesson. I want to end with a celebration. When Paul was all finished with this, I believe by the Holy Spirit now within him writing all of this stuff and he's now having to think it all through and sense out exactly what the Spirit is having him to write down. And so he's putting all this information down about the Jews are set aside but they're not abandoned and the Gentiles that are believers ought not to be haughty but all of this is coming so that Jesus Christ would be glorified and people will come to faith in Christ and there's a great future ahead. And at the end of all of this, guess what happens? The end of chapter 11, he explodes in this tremendous praise. I don't even have to give you an exegete of this. Just read this. And if this doesn't give you that sense of praising and glorifying the Lord because God is sovereign, God is faithful, he will keep his word. Now, while you're transferring that to Israel, pause for a moment and say, just like he was with Israel, he is that faithful to you, like he was to the people group. He was that way with the individual Paul. Let's just look at the passage. Listen to it as I read it to you now. How excited Paul is. He's excited about the faithfulness of God. And here's what he says. At the end of saying, For God has shut up all in disobedience so that he might show mercy to all, that we have a faithful, merciful God. He erupts into this. Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and the knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and unfathomable are his ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord? Or who became his counselor? Sounds like Job speaking. Or who has first given to him that it might be paid back to him again? Who can do that? For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. Now, if you take that passage of scripture and you lay it in your Bible as it's found, and you start at Romans, I don't believe he's merely giving that wonderful, how can I say, doxology at the end of chapter 11, for chapter 11. I don't think he's giving it at the end of chapter 11 because of what he said on the sovereignty of God in chapter 9, 10, and 11. I believe he's giving this doxology 
in this place in Romans, it goes all the way back to Romans 1.1 1, 1, as it begins by how wicked we are, how much we need a Savior, how the very fact that we're secure in Christ can never lose it, the sovereignty of God through all of this, the way that we're sanctified, and he ends with all of this, to God be the glory. Now watch carefully, and I'll end, I promise, I promise. He's doing all this to lay the groundwork of who God is, who we are, and we're saved by what he's done for us, not by our works. He now gives us great praise because next week he's going to talk about the faithfulness of God as we move forward into service with him. I said that to remind you that our core value here is that our intimacy with the Lord will fuel our outreach for the Lord. So perhaps that's why he said nothing about how do we live our Christian life until he laid the groundwork of doctrine first and then how to be intimate with him, how to celebrate his greatness by his glory that now fuels us from that perspective into serving him. So we serve him not because we're going to get something from him. We serve him because we've already received something from him. We serve him to give our way of saying, thank you, God, for who you are and what you've done in our life. And so when we now proceed through the rest of Romans, it gives us the, the motivation to propel us to live a life separated unto the Lord because of who he is and what he's done and specifically how it's now fleshed out to the nation of Israel. Let's pray. With every head bowed and every eye closed, only the Spirit of God could can so permeate your being to give you that kind of spirit of exaltation of the Lord. Not exaltation, but exaltation. That spirit of, of full rejoicing, but yet humbly giving to God the glory of who he is. Now, he's revealed all of this, and I'm going to tell you, we just talked about the mountain peaks, and we flew over those mountain peaks at 30,000 feet. Can you imagine what it would be like if we walked through these verses word by word and phrase by phrase slowly, and we opened up these phrases by looking at all the other verses and how it's all beautifully attached together in a sovereign God who inspired the word of God to be errorless for us. Just this little bit, we can see a, the magnitude and the majesty of God. Oh, dear friends, those who are listening to this today, I pray that you will do the very thing that God so desperately is calling you to do, and that is to place your faith in Jesus Christ. You must believe that Christ is God, and He is. He is the great I Am. And that he loved you so much, and because we've all sinned, we needed a savior, a redeemer, a rescuer. And the only one who could do this completely because of our depravity is Jesus Christ himself, the perfect one, who took upon him all the sin of us. And when he died, he paid the complete payment and rose again from the dead, and it satisfied God the Father. And God the Son, being God, then offers to you right now eternal life. We're reading about his faithfulness. He's not going to then um, contradict his own character, for he cannot. And he says, he that believes on me will have right now everlasting life. And his character says he's a God who cannot lie. So if you believe in him, not believe he existed merely, but trust in him, believe in him, trust in him, depend upon him. He says, you will have right now everlasting life. All of the tenses are an immediate salvation. It'll be realized in practicality more in eternity, but you have it right now, and it'll never be snatched away. God will never lose you. You are a community of the redeemed. You may be a remnant, but you'll never be rejected. But you must come to faith in Christ. How much faith? Enough faith that it took for you to sit on that chair. You trusted it to hold you up. That's all the faith you need to trust in Jesus to take you up to heaven when you die. So maybe you'd say this to the Lord. Remember, those who call upon him, you might simply say, Lord, I know I've done things wrong, but I believe you'll forgive me of all my sin, and I'm trusting in you and you alone to give to me eternal life. Now, it's not even a prayer. It's that mental transaction. It's that thing going on where you're fully giving yourself in dependence upon Christ for that forgiveness so that it's not of works, otherwise it can't be by grace. Now, if you're doing that, I'd like to pray for you. And so maybe you'd like to let me know on that card or see me afterwards.
But please trust Christ as your Savior. Don't delay. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we come before you now. We know that filling out a card, walking an aisle, raising a hand, none of those things will get us into heaven because those are all external. It's when we, in our heart, trust you as our Savior. Oh, Lord, the majesty of Jesus Christ, the faithfulness of Almighty God, the revelation of your word, how we see it played out in our own life as we open up the newspapers and listen to it and go to the news stations on the Internet to see what's happening to Israel and how that there'll be tremendous judgment, but they will never be extinguished, never, ever. And so, Lord, thank you for your faithfulness. In Jesus' name, amen.